AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Today's guest has been on the show before, but now she has a beautiful brand new book out called California Vegan. I just have to show you the photography is absolutely stunning, and I just found out she actually did it herself, and she's going to be making a recipe from this book, the Pomegranate Faro Bowl. Her name is Sharon Palmer, but she's known as the Plant Powered Dietitian. Please welcome her back to the show. It's great to see you again. Hi, AJ. It's so fun to be here. And congratulations on the book. I, I mean, I, I, this, the photography is beautiful. And the fact that you did it yourself, it's even more spectacular. Thank you. I've, you know, I've been working with photography for years, you know, uh, writing recipes for my blog. And so it was really fun to actually do the, my own photography for this book. And of course, you know, the whole style of California vegan eating is so colorful and healthy and fresh. So it was not a, a big chore to take all those photos. I mean, I mean, if you look at I me, mean, like it just jumps off the page. It, it just, you just, yeah. want to, you just, do you ever do photography for other people's books? I have not, um, um, but I've done it for my blog, you know, uh, so, and all of the, you know, the recipes I've cooked at home for my family. And when we finally say, okay, that recipe's done, it's good enough that it goes in the book or on my blog. But it's, it's a really fun kind of artistic expression to, you know, to, to look at doing food photography. I just posted a blog on how to do food photography because I get so many questions about it. Wow. Well, I have to, ch I, I do subscribe to your blog. I don't subscribe to a lot, but your, your, your recipes, it's always, I love your blog and I'll, I'll put a link so okay. people want to check it out, but that sounds like a great post because we don't know anything about that. And I was telling them, I said, just take a picture. You know, it's better than not having a picture, but that would be so cool if we could learn it. Yeah, there's a lot of things that you can do. I started out with my iPhone and then, you know, I just took little classes here and there, webinars, like one hour webinars, and you just practice and practice and you get better over time. But it, it, it's a fun artistic thing to do when you're working with food. It is. That is beautiful. So what, what is a California vegan? Well, we are because we're both in California, even though we're in different yeah. parts. <laughs> we know what it's about. But, you know, my, my whole idea with this book was to celebrate the style of eating we have in California because I think it's unique, but I also think it can inspire other, uh, other people no matter where you live. And uh, this book really started because I, I recently got my master's in sustainable food systems and I, I had to choose a project to study in my own region in sustainability. So of course I studied plant-based diets. And it, when I studied it, I realized that California has a very special history in plant-based eating because even dating back to the original people, I live in Ojai where all the Chumash tribe uh, were the in, in, original peoples. And they ate acorns and, and greens and chia seeds grow here and herbs. And then, you know, we have all the plant-based doctors that came from here, you know, Loma Linda where I went to school uh, became one of the blue zones. And then all this innovation, like with plant-based food companies they're in California. So I. There's a really special vibe here for California eating, and I wanted to celebrate that uh, in the book, but also inspire people no matter where they live. You know, it, it must be. So you got your RD at Loma Linda? Yes, I did. So it must be different. I and mean, were you already plant based when you got your RD, or did that make you become plant based? Well, I was raised in an almost vegetarian family. Like we were, my mom and dad tried to be 100% vegetarian, so we were almost. Um, there would be little screw ups here and there. So then at Loma Linda, it's completely plant-based campus. Way back when I went to school a long time ago, it was plant-based. You know, you there was no meat in the in the in the supermarkets in town. There was no meat at the university, at the medical center. So that was like another kind of uh, important part of my my um, my knowledge base. You know, it, it really helped kind of put me along that path for more plant-based education. Do people go there specifically because it's plant-based, you think? Well, you know, they're very famous for their heart programs. Way, way back when, you know, their heart programs. So they, way, they were so ahead of their time. When people weren't embracing this, they not, knew that plant-based diets were good for heart health. And so, you know, that was part of that program. But it's also part of, you know, their uh, religious and moral beliefs in that particular faith, they're based on some damaged community and they believe strongly in this sort of lifestyle. So it's 
all wrapped up and now we know, you know, and the thing that's so cool is Loma Linda's where all the research first started coming out supporting health, health benefits for plant-based diets. So it's a special place. I heard you can even get a PhD in plant-based nutrition there now. Yeah, they have a new program. I wish they'd had that like a few years ago for me, but now I got my master's in sustainable food systems. But yeah, they have a whole new program. It looks really cool. I'm excited about it. I wish they, I could do the PhD like online because they when I inquired, I couldn't because I just don't, even though Loma Linda is only about an hour from me, I don't want to be driving every day to school, you know? <laughs> yeah, I know. That's a lot because you're busy and you have your own life going on. Yeah. Because I hear from young people that are interested in being a dietitian, but they're already vegan. They don't want to go to a school that's going to force you know, these teachings yes. of, you know, you have to have meat on them. So I'm guessing they probably didn't do that at Loma Linda. No, they don't do that. I mean, they did try to meet everyone's needs because not every dietetic student was vegan, but they don't, I mean, it's their, it's their philosophy, you know, that plant-based is the way to go. So it is in everything they talk about. So I think it would be a great option for students who are, you know, there are a lot of dietetic students now that are vegan going into the program into, they want to be a dietitian. I hear from them all the time. It's like, tell me what I can do as a vegan dietitian, you know? So That's, like you can, you can mentor some of these people then. Yes, I do. I have interns that I work with. I'm all, I love to learn from young dietitians and hopefully I can share some things for them too. That's great. Well, what, what's so cool, what I really love about you is you're, you're not just an, you know, plant-based vegan, a registered dietitian, but your recipes, just from your blog, you, you have really delicious, beautiful recipes. Thank you so much. Uh, you do too. You inspire me so much. Oh, yeah. I, I actually took some culinary training too. Dietitians do get some culinary training, but I'm on my own. I took some more. Um, I'm always learning. That's cool. So what recipe have you chosen from the book to make for us today? So I think I make the cover photo, which is my, the pomegranate uh, barrel bowl, but I'm going to make it quinoa so that people who are on a gluten-free diet could have this. And I, I know you hear from a lot of people too. I hear from a lot of people who are eating plant-based, but they also are avoiding gluten for medical reasons or whatever. So I always try to provide um, on all my recipes, a way to make it gluten-free so I'm making it with quinoa today instead of the farro. That's but great. But this is kind of like a Mediterranean. And actually, all the things that are in this book, I grow here um, in my garden. The citrus, um, the pomegranates, the mint, all this stuff I grow uh, in my garden. So that was kind of why I love to have it on the cover. And it's kind of, it's a little, it's more of a winter profile. I mean, you can still kind of get some of these things right now that we're going into spring, but it's so colorful. Yeah, it looks, I, I love bowls. I mean, you know, people always want recipes, just eat in a bowl and then you have a million recipes. Yeah, people love bowls and I think they're great for plant-based because it's no meal planning. It's like you, you, you compose, compose your bowl with all of the food groups, you know, your grains, your pr plant proteins, your veggies, you know, your seasonings. So I think it's easy for people to see that they're planning a healthy diet that way. Do you still, all the years you've been doing this, get the question, well, you know, where do you get your protein from people? I got, I was at a medical appointment this morning and it wasn't the normal nurse that I see for my appointment. And, you know, I have this mask on because you have to wear a mask here. And it says vegan since 1977. She goes, well, you know, I, I would do it, but where would you get your protein? And it's like, you know, the 10 millionth time you have to answer that question, but you can answer it. I mean, you have credentials, so I'm sure you get that question and can answer it. I get that question all the time. I just got it last Friday from a reporter I was doing an interview for. And the thing that I think that is interesting, of course, you can get enough protein. Research shows on average vegans do get enough protein um, because, you know, basically every plant food has some protein. Uh, if it's whole, you know, it's not overly processed, but then we have our plant protein superstars like beans and lentils and tofu and peas and peanuts. And um, then we have things like whole grains that also have protein. And then we have veggies, vegetables also have protein. So it's all giving us protein. But one of the things that, uh, I don't know if you saw this research that was done by the True Health Initiative, but they published a paper saying that we have to stop talking about quality of protein. You know, people say a high quality protein because it has all the amino acids, because what is quality? Isn't quality sustainable, healthy? 
like proteins that aren't just amino acids, but quality should be about sustainability, about healthfulness, like legumes, pulses are so healthy compared to animal protein choices, like red meat, for example. So I like to get that. Why we should, I think we need to start talking about that because it's not just, the protein choices are not just grams of protein. It's what those protein choices are doing for you and the planet. If, you know, if protein is so important to our growth and development, then why is breast milk only 5% protein? You would think that if it's that crucial, it would be a lot more protein. I know we don't need as much protein as people think we do. I mean, people over consume protein in this country and it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, we have, you know, one of the highest meat consumptions in the world and yeah. it's just this over uh, value people overvalue protein. They think they need more than they really do. You know, I'll never forget when I was appearing on the Holistic Holiday at Sea Cruise, you know, I, I, I just tend to love wearing vegan things anyway, just, you know, t-shirts, necklaces, Linda Middlesworth, who's watching, is always giving me earrings, things that say anything, but that's just how I've always been. And so I'm on the cruise and I don't remember which shirt I had, but obviously, you know, it was one that I was vegan and it was during the breakfast buffet. And I'm not kidding you, there was this very obese man and he had, uh, his whole plate was bacon. It wasn't like two or four strips. I mean, it was like as much bacon as you could put on a plate, right? And he's walking to me, he goes, well, you're vegan, where do you get your protein? And I felt like saying, where do you get your fiber, you know? <laughs> exactly, I mean, Americans are so short on fiber and we used to eat so much in our native diets, you know, we used to eat pounds of vegetables a day. Now it's terrible, but, but the plant-based diet is definitely, you know, rich in fiber, which is one of the benefits of the, of the diet. Do they not understand like elephants and cows? These are vegans and, yeah. and they just eat plants. I know it's really something how, how people, you know, have a mind block against, against it. You know, I do, I am encouraged because of course, talking about California again, it's getting so mainstream here. It's so easy to find plant-based options and, uh, compared to what it used to be. But, um, and research shows during COVID, I don't know if you saw the studies that people were eating more plant-based during COVID um, because, you know, some of those bad reports from meat factories. And um, so I hope that sticks with us and people continue on that path. That's fantastic. Last time I was in Ojai, there was at least two vegan restaurants on the main strip. I can't remember their names, but I remember that they were there. Yes. One of my favorites is called Hip Vegan Cafe. That's one of my favorites super creative, really delicious. And they, they stuck through uh, pandemic shutdowns. And then it just every restaurant here has a vegan menu or V, v symbols, you know, it's just very much part of the philosophy here. It's very vegetarian, vegan friendly, very holistic. Um, you know, people practice yoga and meditation. You've been here before, so you kind of know that vibe. And then we grow so much food here too. It's just amazing uh, growing climate. I love the farmer's market you guys have on Sunday. And I forget the name, Rainbow Acres. Is that the name of the store? Uh, there's a really Rainbow nice- Rainbow Market. I love, that's where I go shopping. Okay. You're saying all my favorite places. <laughs> uh, yeah, Ohio is one place I mean, I would consider living there. It's, it's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. It's so nice to be here right now during this period. And I'm planting my veggie garden and I have a little bit of area to, to do some fruit trees. And so I'm excited. That is so cool. So let's see what you got for us in terms of this. Okay, bowl. let's make this recipe then. So this, this recipe starts with cooking your whole grains. And as I was mentioning, the recipe calls for farro, which is a form of, of a whole wheat. It's an ancient kind of a, from Tuscany rather, uh, a form of wheat. So this is really nice and crunchy. I love it. But if you wanted to do a gluten-free option, you could do another grain like quinoa or sorghum or millet. I chose sorghum, uh, um, sorry, quinoa today. So I just cooked this up ahead of time so we'd have it ready. But you just basically boil it according to package directions to make four cups of cooked quinoa uh, or grains. And then you kind of let it chill a little bit. And then what we are going to do is make up a little uh, Mediterranean salad. Cause this whole flavor profile is this kind of a Middle Eastern Mediterranean amazing, you know, when you think about the pomegranates, the cucumbers and all these uh, spices and herbs. So what we're gonna do is make this salad and, and it calls for three small cucumbers. I really love these little Ar Armenian cucumbers. They're just really tender and just the right size and keep the peels on because you need that fiber from there. You do not need to throw away those peels. I just trim the ends and I, 
I save every, all my vegetable scraps and compost them. I totally recommend composting for your vegetable garden or even your, whatever your landscaping is. You're not adding it to the landfill. So I'm just gonna slice up the three cucumbers here into thin little slices. I'm doing it the easy way, doing all three at the same time. And then the other ingredient is pomegranate seeds or pomegranate arrows. So I grow pomegranates here. I have 30 year old pomegranate bushes that came with our house. And they just, when I say I had a thousand pomegranates, I'm not kidding. It's like, I was giving them to everywhere, everybody I could, and I froze them and they do quite well frozen. So if you can't find um, fresh pomegranates, you can usually find frozen in a lot of, a lot of markets. So these, these are my frozen pomegranate arrows I'm gonna use. Do you have, any, then, tricks? Do you have any tricks for deseeding them easily? Yes, you know, we tried so many things with all of our pomegranates this year that um, the one thing I found is to soak them underwater, to split them or cut them and then uh, have them underwater and, and just kind of start loosening them up. And then the membrane, those white membranes kind of flip to the top and it avoids all that splatter. Do you have any other tips, uh, AJ? That's what I do. tip is you buy them at Trader Joe's already done for you. <laughs> yes, I agree. That's a very good point. And, and sometimes the pomegranate arrows are not in season. It might be a little harder to find. Um, but when you when they are in season already seeded, I am a huge fan of buying them like that because they're so easy. They yeah. do have a short expiration. Uh, they, do, they sometimes seem to ferment and they almost smell like alcohol if you don't eat them right yeah. away. Yes, they go quickly. So here's my pomegranate seeds that I, from my pomegranate tree that I have frozen. So, and I, I have seen the, those in the freezer section in most stores. And then we're gonna have um, some green onions that I've got here. These are these really pretty pink ones I got from a local, the local farmer's market. I'm gonna slice those in here. I'm gonna use the bottoms and the tops. Um, so again, that really beautiful Mediterranean profile. And then we're going to use mandarins. And you know, those are right in season right now. I have them growing on my tree. I had a 30 year old mandarin tree that's just providing hundreds of mandarins. So those are in season. So this is kind of a nice uh, recipe to celebrate those citruses, uh, citrus fruits that are in season. So I have two mandarins. And you know what, you could use canned mandarins if you wanted to without the sugar, you know, get them in water pack or juice pack. But what I do is I just peel these and section them. I try to take some of the pith off, which is that white membrane. Um, but you know what? There's actual nutrition in that white membrane. Research is showing. So I don't think, you know, people get so picky about taking off every little tiny thing, but the whole plant is good for us. That's why I don't peel things. So basically I just, just separate out here. I, I keep the skins on, just separate it in here like that. So you know what, I've, I've had dinner with Dr. Greger and he eats the stem of the strawberry. He doesn't take it off. He eats the whole thing. He eats the peel from the kiwi. And I eat the, I, I love the green part of the cauliflower that a lot of people throw away. It's like my favorite part. That is so true. You know, we don't eat all the vegetable. Why, you know, somewhere along the way, what the supermarket carried is what we started eating. But like celery, if you grow celery, it's covered with leaves and they're so tasty. Cat, like you said, I think you said cauliflower, right? Oh, I love the green part of the cauliflower. It's so tasty. And broccoli, broccoli grows with these beautiful leaves that are edible. So eat the whole thing, you know? I mean, even beet greens you can cook, radish greens. I've had served uh, radish with hummus or something where you eat the green too. You dip it and then you eat the green. So try to eat more of the whole plant, you know, so we're avoiding food waste and uh, it's just really good and healthy. So it also, we're also gonna put some mint in here. This is, I just harvested this from my garden. Mint is a super easy uh, herb to grow. In fact, it will take over. So you should try to, if you're gonna try to grow mint, put it in a pot and it'll come back, it'll go dormant and come back. So I'm just putting some mint leaves in here. It's almost like instead of my salad grains, this is gonna be mint leaves. And you see that in a lot of Middle Eastern uh, dishes where it's, there is a lot of mint or parsley. Um, so it's really flavorful. And right now my mint is just gorgeous. Yeah. So you know, I, I just had Doug Evans on the show and he got me all excited about sprouting. Do you either sprout yourself or buy sprouts or eat sprouts? You know, I love sprouting and I have not started doing it myself. There's this 
At the farmer's market in Ojai, there's someone who does a beautiful job of sprouting. So I've just, every week I get it and it's so beautiful. And like even the sprouted pulses, they have sprouted lentils and all the grains. It's so good. So you're into that, huh? No, oh, no, not yet. Somebody, my, my, Elspeth, who's been a guest on the show many times is sending me something for my birthday, which is a week from today with the, the jars. And I, I'm not into it yet. I was just inspired to do it because I love the taste of sprouts, especially broccoli sprouts. And you know, that you know, a little container like this at sprouts was like $4 and you could buy yeah. like a year's worth of seeds practically. Yeah, I know. I need to get into it. Thanks for reminding me because I, it would be a fun thing to do. And I don't think it's that hard too. And you know, they go fast, they, they can go quickly. So if you do it yourself, you can take advantage. There's no transportation time. You can just have them immediately. I'm also going to chop up two garlic. That's going to go in here. So this is a very simple kind of a salad. And we're going to make a bowl. We're going to start with a, the uh, quinoa or farro, depending on what you chose. And then this salad goes on top. And then we're going to make this really easy yogurt dressing that is so good. I love it now. It's one of my favorites. If you're looking for some kind of like a, this is made with cultured almond yogurt. So just the plain, when you can find the plain that doesn't have anything on it, just the almond, I like that flavor profile. So you can make a really simple kind of a, almost like a tzatziki type dressing. Have you ever tried that, AJ? Uh, yes, I, I, I tried, uh, Kathy Fisher had a recipe, I believe, and it. it's, it's delicious. It's made out of cucumbers, right? Yeah, the, it's just an herbed, simple herbed yogurt dressing. So I kind of made one with, um, I have my cucumbers in here, but the dressing has uh, just cultured almond yogurt plain. And then it has all these seasonings with lemon juice, garlic. It's so good. You could use it on all sorts of things. So I've got my garlic in here and I'm going to put about, about a tablespoon of lemon. These are lemons from my tree because citrus loves this. Citrus loves California. In fact, that's one of the things that I talk about in my book. If you're trying to add more of a California vibe to your cooking, citrus is one thing, you know, because we really have this climate that can grow a lot of citrus, but you can get citrus, you know, in your supermarket and that can add that really bright, healthy, fresh flavor to things. So oranges, limes, grapefruit, orange, um, pomelo, tangerines, mandarins, and then also herbs are another hallmark of California vegan cuisine in my mind, um, just adding those fresh herbs really adds a lot. How do you keep everything fresh in your refrigerator? Things like herbs and cucumbers. Do you have a secret? You know what I do is I, um, I'm going to add a little bit of ground coriander right now to the salad. What I usually do is I like to just take a little jar like this or a drinking glass, fill it with water and then stand up my herbs in there like a vase almost. So the roots are in the, in the water and then keep it in my refrigerator. That works really well for cilantro, parsley, things like that. Have you tried? Is that have you tried anything that you have a tip? Now, you know, the only, uh, the, I, there's these bags and they're green. I forget what they're called. I know that they've been proven to keep it longer. I think if, if, when you eat as much as we do, we don't have the need to store it as long. You know, that's true, absolutely true. So I just add a little black pepper, and this is it. This is my salad. It's super colorful. It looks like the picture here. So this is the salad that goes on top of the grain bowl. And then I'm going to make up the dressing. Yeah, you're right about what you said about, you know, when you're eating as much produce as we do, it's a shocking. We go to the farmer's market. I posted a picture yesterday with a little cart. It's full, just mostly for the two of us. It will be gone by Sunday. Like we eat so much produce. So this is what this salad looks like. Super colorful. You've got the red and the orange and the green. So we're gonna put that aside and then I'm gonna make this little dressing. And so I've got just one little carton of almond, cultured almond yogurt. Again, plain, no flavor, no sweetener, just to be the base of this. And this is a great way that you could incorporate, you know, more, you know, kind of a new sauce if you're looking for a new sauce. It's low in fat, you know, super healthy and light. So I'm just basically putting it in here. And then I'm going to add some, another garlic here, chop of garlic, and then I will add some more lemon juice and some seasonings. And this, you know, the great thing is this recipe is so easy because you just cook up your grains 
and I like to cook some grains at the beginning of the week and then I just have them for other things, you know, like as a side dish. Um, so this could be your grains that you've cooked up. So I'm just chopping some garlic here for the sauce. And then I've got some thyme. Got some thyme that's gonna go in there. And then uh, I've got some cumin. So it's kind of a Middle Eastern profile. Are pomegranate seeds seeds? I mean, like, but they're caloric. I, I just, I, I'm just very interested in caloric density, but they're not, they're not the same type of seeds as like pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds, which have a caloric density of 2,600 calories per pound. Are they, are, but they are technically seeds, right? Are you, did you say the pomegranate seeds or are you talking about? Yeah, the areals. Are, I mean, are, are they classified no, as seeds or they, are they a fruit? They're actually a, a seed uh, of the pomegranate, but they do not have very much fat. So that's a very good question because when you eat the pomegranate with this, you know, to eat the whole thing, there's very little fat in pomegranate. So those seeds, you know, some seeds are richer in fat and then other seeds are not. So when we think about pumpkin seeds and sunflower seeds, they, they do have quite a bit of fat, but these, uh, maybe it's because they're in the fruit family, fruit, fruit seeds typically um, don't have uh, as much fat. That's a great question. I just, Basically, I'm whipping this up. I'm going to add a little lemon juice, just a tablespoon or so. And that's really it. Super easy dressing. This would be really good with falafels or veggie balls. Um, it would, it's just super great. I love it. Um, lentil patties. I'm oh, sorry, sorry. A couple of questions in that chat. Linda said, what brand of yogurt are you using? And Jennifer wanted to know if you cook your grains with veggie broth or just water. So for this recipe, I just did water because there's so much flavor here. I didn't think it needed veggie broth, but I do love to cook my grains in veggie broth, but I liked the simplicity of this. I didn't want to fight with all these flavors here. So I'm going to, and then uh, for the brand, this is Kite Hill. I really love their uh, plain um, cultured yogurt. It has just this really bright flavor. It's, it doesn't have any strange aftertaste or anything. I love to cook with this one. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make two bowls here. And I'm just, uh, this makes four, by the way, this makes four healthy, you know, meal size bowls, but you just put your grains on the bottom. And then I always like to have a lot of pretty bowls uh, like this for, for our bowl meals. You know, they're great for food photography, but they're fun to eat out of it. The great thing about this is it could be meal prep. So you could do your four, four bowls and then grab and go. This is really good cold. I like it as a cold salad bowl. So you could just do your four meal preps and then you have meals, you know, and this, this holds up pretty well. I've had this in the refrigerator for a few days and it, it has, it really holds up, it doesn't wilt. So we just kind of put our salad on each serving here. Again, this makes about four, just arrange it on here. And then we are going to drizzle on our, our dressing. This makes a nice amount of dressing and it's very light. So I don't mind using extra. You know, when I serve this, this is a really fun thing to serve when people come over. I've served it before and it's so pretty. And then I just put this out and let people put their own dressing on. So then I make a little bit extra because it's, I just like to glob it on. It's just really pretty and kind of dollops. And then I finish it with a little bit of sesame seeds, just as a garnish, you know, just a little dusting. The sesame seeds are part of this culture of this kind of Middle Eastern tradition, just as a garnish. And then sumac, have you tried sumac? I'm sure you've used sumac. You know, I, it, it's very it's very bright. And uh, we had a doctor on the show doing a demo and said for people that are avoiding salt, it has something, a quality that's just very good. Yeah, I don't know a lot about the, the actual, you know, like what phytochemicals, but it is bright red. So I'm sure it's filled with phytochemicals and it does have a really great flavor that, that kind of like takes away that, you know, need. I think all of the spices and herbs can really take away that need for salt. I hardly ever use salt. As you notice, no salt and it's packed with flavor. So I just add a little sumac. Sometimes if you eat at a Mediterranean uh, restaurant, you might've noticed they put sumac on a salad or something. And that is, gives it this beautiful red color. So we've got two bowls and then 
you know, we could just serve these. This is what we're going to have for dinner tonight. <laughs> or maybe lunch. So then you just serve it with your nice little napkin and your fork and you're ready to go. Oops. So this is the, the cover recipe on this, on this book. And it's really one of my favorites you know, from the whole book. So I had to make this one for you today. Well, so I, I called this episode the name of the recipe, which was pomegranate farro bowl. And Kim said, I'm excited to learn how to cook farro. We used a different grain just in deference to people who are gluten-free. But how do you cook farro? I don't believe I've ever had it. So, yeah, you cook farro just like any other whole grain. Uh, it is the bigger your whole grain kernel, the more cooking time it generally takes. So quinoa is a tiny grain. It can take like 15 minutes to cook. Farrow can take more like 45 minutes. And I, I don't remember right off the top of my head the, the water equivalent, like how much water you use. I think it's about two to one, but I would, I don't quote me on that. But uh, it, I like to cook it for about 45 minutes. Now I like my grains a little chewy. So if you buy farro and you get the package, I like Bob's Bread Mill has a beautiful farro, but there are many other brands, but just follow the directions because you need four cups for this recipe. And it says that in the, in the book as well, but just follow the cooking directions. But I like my grains chewier, so I never cook them as long as it calls for. I like them like nutty. I don't like them soggy. So you can cook it till it's the texture you like. But it's I, a very nutty, chewy whole grain. It's really good in salads, like whole grain salads or as a side dish. I've used it in veggie burgers. It's, or instead of pasta with sauce, it's so good. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I agree with you. I don't like soggy grains. I don't like anything soggy. I'm, I'm just not, uh, I'm not a moist person. I'm more of a toothsome person, I guess. Yes. Uh, That's yes. the best parts of eating vegan is all the chewiness in my mind. I love all the crunch and texture. Yeah. So people are asking for the recipe. Sharon was kind enough to give it to us. It's in the show notes, but you guys be kind enough to buy the book so that you can get all the wonderful, <laughs> beautiful recipes and the beautiful photography. Just every page you open up, it's just really like, a, like could it almost be a coffee? Oh, look at this one. Beautiful delicious oh, recipes okay. what are those little oranges i forget uh, ohi is known for when i used to uh, teach um, at father is it pixies or cuties they always have those yeah. little oranges good memory pixies it's a variety of uh, tangerines and it's a very unique variety that only grows here and they're famous for being sweet and crunchy like super crunchy so uh that like it's a big deal like pixie season your flags all over the place I have a pixie tree and it should be ready in like a few weeks. And then you're going to see everybody putting pixies and everything. That they are so good. You have to come for pixie season. <laughs> well, I think I must have been there during pixie season. Cause like, I remember the, the, the spa just like, there were huge, just bowls sitting out of these little tiny oranges that kind of reminded me of cuties. Yeah. They're, yeah. They're similar. They're so good. So and Lauren says we're pronouncing a uh, farro differently. You say farro, I say farro, potato, potato. I, I don't know what it's called. I've never had it. So. Yeah, I probably, you know, I've always said farro, but I'm sure it's pronounced farro. You know, there's different ways to pronounce it, like you said, but it is actually an Italian ancient um, grain. It, it is linked back to the Tuscan area, area. So it's one of the ancient wheat forms and you can find it at most well-stocked supermarkets in the grain section. I mean, it's, if you look at it like wheat berries, you've probably tried wheat berries, which is just uh, like red wheat that is, that has the kernels that you can cook. And farro is a little bit longer and more narrow where wheat berries are more compact. Um, but it is in that family. If you think about what you do with wheat berries, you could do the same thing with farro. Have you ever had frica? I have. I love it. Have you used that? I, and you know, I'm gluten. I, I, I actually do have a true gluten intolerance, so I've never had any of these, but I, I just like the name Frika. Yes. It's another form of wheat and it's really good. Like if you're cooking with bulgur, I have a recipe for Frika on my blog. You can check out, but it's, if you, it kind of, it, it's a Middle Eastern um, sort of wheat. It's good in recipes that would call for bulgur. It's great as in skillet meals, you know, any way that you would use any of these other whole grains, it's great. It has a shorter cooking time because it's like little, it's more like cracked meat. Yeah. Yeah. I've never had bulgur either. So Mandy says, what's your favorite thing to grow in your garden? Well, I love herbs. I have to say, I, I feel like if you have herbs growing, 
you can, you just use them all the time. And they're so, they're so easy to grow. I always tell people the first thing, if you're trying to grow is start with herbs. Um, and it depends on your growing climate in California. We, you know, in the summer I can grow basil and chi chili peppers and all these things. In the winter I can grow dill, um, uh, parsley, uh, cilantro, mild, the milder weather. I can grow some of those milder. Oregano goes crazy, rosemary year round. But um, I also love to grow seasons. So right now I'm doing my spring garden. So that'll be radishes and carrots and kale and peas. And then the summer will be things like beans and corn and tomatoes and bell peppers. So I follow the seasons. So Elizabeth wants to know, do you ever visit Middle Eastern shops for your spices? I do, I love them so much. And that's another thing I love to recommend is to try global markets, you know, in California, we have all of them, but you know, there's, they're in many cities around the United States. So that's one way you can introduce more diverse global flavors is, is just checking them out. Try the seasonings, um, try some unique ingredients, new grains, some new veggies. But I love to go to Indian, to Asian markets, to Middle Eastern markets. Uh, they're so fun. Have you ever tried a spice called hing? No, I have not. What is that? Well, it's it's uh, it's for like some people can't have onion and garlic for whatever reason, and supposedly it takes. I've never had it. I've just heard about it from Darshana Thacker actually when she was on the summit making a recipe. And I was just wondering if you ever tried it. I have not. I'm gonna have to look that up. I thought I'd tried just about every spice there was, but apparently oh. not. I think you probably would get it in an Indian place. Okay. I love Indian spices. They're so amazing. And also the spice blends. And I love the Moroccan spice blends too. Those are some of my favorites. What's your favorite thing to cook in general? Um, I love to make bowls like this. This is really fun. I love to do like roasted things like roasted veggie, you know, sheet pan meals. But I also love to make comfort food. Like last night, um, you know, I'm trying, my husband is Swedish. So I'm, I'm experimenting with traditional Swedish cooking and to make it plant-based. And in the winter time, there's this cabbage casserole that has animal protein. And I've been, I found an old recipe and I've been using lentils so that these, it's a cabbage layered casserole and I'm using lentils. So it's that comfort food, that savory, and you just eat it with boiled potatoes and it really was good. So those comfort things are always really satisfying too. I always say that when you're eating plant-based, you should never feel hungry because, you know, these dishes can really be satisfying, you know, really make you feel satisfied. It's not about going starving yourself at all. Absolutely. Uh, Marcy says, can you talk about iron? Because she keeps getting def iron deficiency questions from her daughter. Yes. You know, a lot of people are afraid fearful of plant-based eating because of iron deficiency, but you can get enough iron if you eat a balanced diet with whole plant foods, make sure you're getting pulses in there, whole grains in there, um, you know, a variety of vegetables. And, um, you know, I, I recommend a, you know, a moderate amount of nuts or seeds, you know, just to make sure you're getting some of these nutrients, but I have had no problem with iron deficiency at all. Now, one of the tips you can do is Iron is better absorbed in the presence of vitamin C. So of course, look at our dish now. We have a lot of vitamin C, we eat this way. So usually I've got my grains, but I've got vitamin C in here, which is gonna enhance the absorption of the iron in the grains. But um, so try to make sure that your plate has vitamin C. And of course, most of our plates do have that, but you know, you're eating some fresh veggies and fresh fruits with your meals. And then the other thing you can do is use a cast iron skillet that can really provide more iron. And it, my iron status is excellent and I don't take a supplement. And I think it's because my mother was Southern and she always cooked with a cast iron skillet. I cook with a cast iron skillet. So that's helping me too. But you can still, you can get iron in a balanced, healthy diet with all those food groups. Nice. And there's a question about herbs. Uh, Randy says, should you wash your herbs and then store them in the fridge once they're dry? Yeah, you know what? With most delicate things, I wash it right before I'm going to use it, um, unless it's just muddy or something, because once you wash it, sometimes you lose some of your shelf life. Um, but 
if I'm going to use it right away, then I will wash it before I store it. But if it, I want it to last all week long, I usually clip off what I want and just wash that and let it dry first to get maximum lifetime out of it. Nice. And Lauren says, do you grow your herbs in the pots or in the ground? Well, I grow my herbs in the ground, although certain things that go crazy, mint, I have in a pot because mint will take over your garden and it has this root system that is very hard to get out. So I have a pot for mint that I've had for, I think, 10 years now. It just keeps, you know, it goes dormant and then it comes back. And then rosemary is another one that will just go crazy. So if, if you, rosemary is a beautiful landscaping plant, but if you don't want it to go crazy, you might want to have that in a pot. But other than that, I have my herbs in the ground and some of them in California, because we don't have a freeze um, in, in the valleys, um, the, some of them you just last for years. My oregano, my thyme will just keep coming back and some of it will kind of reseed itself. And then others I have to replant depending on, like basil I have to replant each year. Nice. All right. So I saw a question here from Linda. Have you helped many of your family members go vegan? My daughter does not want to as her husband fishes all the time. You know, I feel like every, we all have our own style of how we deal with all these things in our families. I have encouraged my family um, to eat more plant-based. And what I've done is just done it in a gradual way because I I feel that I cook beautiful food that everybody would love, no matter what their diet is. So then I just kind of show them how easy and healthy and delicious it is and satisfying and they're not missing anything. And that's what's really worked for me. I've had some of my family members who are now about 95% vegan um, and went from full on, you know, Western diet. So I feel like that's a pretty high success rate for me. So, you know, I feel like we have to, I, that's the way I worked with my family. Um, they see what's working for me and what my passion is. And I don't cook any other foods. When you come to my house, this is what you're going to get, but you're going to love it. And I've had family members go off all meds because of even 95% has made change their life, you know, lost weight, gotten off their blood pressure is normal again. So I'm always working on it, trying to try to get them to go hundred percent. Right. But any percent is better. You know, people don't understand like people, of course, people want people to be vegan hundred percent, but if a lot of people went like 50%, we'd be a lot better than just a few people being hundred percent in terms of the climate, the animals, you know what I mean? I agree hundred percent. That's what I say all the time. If I could in my work, get people, at least some people, even 50% would be a huge impact on animals, health, the planet. Yep. So, you know, even if you can just get on the road to, you know, cutting it, a lot of the research out there shows that if the world cut it by 50%, it would be a huge start. And that's, you know, so if we so can many, do that, yeah. There's so many selfish people that won't make any change at all. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. Uh, Apple says, do you grow purslane? You know what? I don't grow it because it's a weed in my garden. So I actually have harvested it. I love, and there's one of my local farmers who actually grows it, but I, uh, it grows really well in California. I think it grows in a lot of climates. It's I've, I've had it in Sicily, um, in, in salads and, um, it's really good. It has this kind of a minty flavor and it's very, it's got a lot of water content. It's super good. I love it. When I present at Rancho La Puerta, they serve it cooked. I prefer it raw though. And I get it at the, at the Latino markets here. Oh, I have to try that. It's, it's really good. good. And then another uh, foraged green that's amazing is nettles, stinging nettles. I'm obsessed with them. They are so nutrient rich and they have the most amazing flavor. Yeah. I heard about purslane many years ago at Vegetarian Summerfest from Dr. Carrie Saunders, who said as far as uh, green, greens, it's like the highest omega-3 of any other vegetable or green. And I thought, well, that's cool. So yeah, I, I like it though. It tastes good. It's not bitter. Yeah, it's really, it's mild. It's sweet. It's kind of got that herbal flavor. So I actually see it uh, growing all over. It's like a weed. And you know, I've, I've, you can harvest things like this too, if you're on a hike, as long as you know what you're, you have to be confident and then make sure it's clean, you know, and it, so when I harvest wild grains, I make sure it's like not right on the path because of dogs peeing and everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. Oh, Leslie 
Julie says, can you cook with no oil using a cast iron skillet? I think you, I, I have luck with it because I feel like cast iron doesn't stick as much. I don't know what you think about that, but I find it really, I know that, you know, some of the surfaces are a little bit better, but I, I have had a lot of luck with it. Of course, you can use something like a broth or, you know, like a, you know, a, a lemon juice or whatever your vinegar or whatever you're using as a liquid. What, what do you think, AJ? I've never had one. So I honestly don't know. I've never had it. Sometimes if it's a saucy thing, you know, if it's like a really dry thing, you know, like a uh, hash browns or something or, or a home fries, I think potatoes might stick, but, um, but just for like a stir fry or, um, you know, or a curry or anything like that. I feel like I've had luck with it. Nice. I'll have to try it more in terms of, I'll have to try uh, different types of recipes with that, but it's, it's very traditional. Um, you know, that you in the South where my mother grew up, where you would start with a cast iron skillet and have it your whole life. It's like a member of the family after a while. That's funny. Well, Daryl, who's watching live, who always watches live, which I appreciate, says he just bought the book. So thank you. I think you're going to love it. It is beautiful. So we get this question, Sharon, almost every guest gets it. So we may as well just ask it, even though you might have answered it last time. Maybe it's changed. What do you eat in a day? Well, what I usually do is I have steel cut oats for breakfast. I love that. It's kind of my old standby. And I do whatever seasonal fruit. Like right now, we're starting to get strawberries here. So I always, and in the fall, maybe I do persimmons or pears. And then um, I use soy milk. As, uh, and then I might add, I have about an ounce of nuts a day. So then I'll add some for my omega threes there. Walnut, whatever I am in the mood for. And then for lunch, I like, this might be something I might have for lunch. I, I like to have something like a salad, a very hearty salad with maybe chickpeas or beans kale, whatever veggies I have on hand. And then dinner, I like to have something a little nicer, like where I actually cook something like I was talking about my Swedish cabbage casserole. So maybe I'll be experimenting for something for my blog and I like to cook. Although I do a little meal prep because I don't always have time to cook, you know, something elaborate. So I do like to, on Sundays, kind of cook a little bit ahead, like maybe make a big pot of beans so that I have those all week long or a nice pot of soup so that you know you can have that all week long nice do you use things like the instant pot or the air fryer i use the instant pot i have not gotten into the air fryer yet it's on my list but i do use the instant pot because it's super easy i use my slow cooker i like i use a rice cooker although you know the instant pot will do that as well but uh yeah. as much as i love my instant pot i just prefer making my grains in the rice cooker because I don't have to memorize or look up stuff. You know, it's always the same. You use the cup and you go to the line and it's, it's a no brainer. I have to say I'm right there with you. I have this old rice cooker beat up and I just keep going to it. Cause you just, you don't have to worry about anything. And if you just plug it in and then walk away and it doesn't burn and it's always perfect. So I have to say, I have not gotten rid of my rice cooker. Nice. Uh, Janice says potatoes do not stick to cast iron. You need to get the skillet really hot before you add the hash browns. Good tip. I'm going to have to try it this weekend. Yep. Elizabeth says, I love her thick wooden display. Where did she get it? I don't know what she means by your thick wooden display. I think it's, is it this one? This is mine. I love this cutting board. It's a, it's a boost cutting board. And it, um, I love it. I love it. I love it. It's just a natural, I think it's maple wood. And it's just lasts forever and ever. So I actually use this in my kitchen. It's in my kitchen and I chop on it and I scrub it really well uh, with a brush. Thank yeah. you. Did you ever work like, you do, actually, did you ever? We talked about this. This is so interesting before we, we came on live is that you, I was always wonder if plant-based dietitians ever do, you know, working in hospitals before you do what you do. And you actually did near me. Yes, I worked in Palm Springs for a while as a chief clinical dietitian in a hospital. Yeah, I've, I've worked in hospitals. I've worked uh, many years in hospitals as a dietitian working with people who are in the hospital for heart disease or diabetes, doing community classes, and then also as the food service director at a hospital in Pasadena too. Um, and then I, I just 
quit it all. And I started doing my plant power dietitian. I started writing books and writing magazine articles. And I have a million projects that I'm involved with now. I'm actually teaching also on, on an online a master's program in sustainable food systems. So I have a lot of projects now. Oh, that sounds really interesting. Is it hard when you're vegan to work in a clinical setting like that, like where you kind of have to give them animal products if they want it? It is hard. I hear from dietitians all the time about this. And I haven't worked in a hospital setting for over 20 years. But, you know, I hear all the time because it is better now though, AJ. I really think because now you have doctors who are embracing this philosophy, but, oh, you know, a long time ago, you didn't have, you had a lot of resistance, but now you actually have doctors who want their patients to eat this way. Um, so it's a little bit better, but uh, it, it's really hard for dietitians who are plant-based to have to, you know, go to work every day. And I think now what a lot of dietitians are doing is, you know, like if they have a heart patient, they can say something, well, this, you might want to consider this. Have you thought of it? And if it's something that patient is interested in, then they can go ahead, you know, but it's, it's still, you know, a difficult situation for a lot of dietitians. Well, they also don't serve the healthiest food in the hospital cafeteria either. Exactly. And this is another, I'm involved in a project right now about plant-based options in healthcare where um, I created this free, it's at Old Ways, uh, oldwaysPT.org, but I created a free toolkit for hospitals so that every hospital could eventually provide plant-based options for patients when they come in. Um, because right now, California requires hospitals to offer a plant-based option. California and New York, and I think Oregon is coming, but it's actually mandated here that if you are in a hospital, you, you it's, all hospitals have to offer it. Did, did um, you say it was called oldways.org? It's oldways, O-L-D-W-A-Y-S-P-T dot org. Okay, because when I <laughs> what I saw when I went to regular oldways.org is a Wiccan coven, and I didn't think that's what it was. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Oldways P, because I want to pull it up. Oh, that's funny. PT.org. Yeah, they have, I, I helped them with their vegan vegetarian uh, program. So Old Ways is an amazing uh, organization that tries to work with traditional diets. So I, I'm their advisor on their, their vegan vegetarian diet program. And so that was one of my projects is to create this free downloadable so that if you were in a hospital and you just don't have the tools to, to get this, you would have it and you could offer it to your patients. You know? See, I'm learning new things about you. That's so cool. You really are. <laughs> to, you have your fingers in a lot of paws, but you really are <laughs> a lot of great things. Yeah, I'm just trying to help all those people out there who need resources, you know, to, to get more plant-based options. Because, you know, what you said is so true that, you know, hospitals notoriously have unhealthy food, you know, like deep fried foods sodas and you know in the cafeterias it's it's just nothing healthy and then that's not even talk about not enough plant-based options so we have to keep up we need to we need work on on this whole thing right and you know the other thing is is and and i know patients think they're being kind but like when they want to thank their nurses like they'll bring them like a five pound box of C's candy and that's i don't think that's a thank you for somebody that's no. helping them. you know people You're want cash cash or gift cards or something, but not, not candy. No, you're yeah. right. And, and nurses are under a lot of stress. It's a very stressful job. I used to work in hospitals and, you know, that's the last thing they need, um, you know, cause they're, they, you know, they're trying to live healthier, more balanced lives. So it's, it's true. Linda pointed out that Lebanon now has its first all vegan hospital. I read that. I think it's the world's first or something. Although I know we have plant-based programs in, you know, of course, Loma Linda has always been uh, plant-based. And then with Bellevue Hospital in New York has a plant-based program. But I read the headlines on that uh, and it was really interesting. You know, I've, I, before COVID, I, I travel a lot for my work and, you know, I would encounter cities where now like they, I think it was, um, was it Frog? where they made a law that every restaurant has to have a vegan option. So it is changing, you know? Well, that is really great. Well, thanks for being part of the change.
Thank you. And, and I wish you every success with this book. I know a few people have bought it already. I've been posting the link in the show notes where the recipe is, but check it out because let's see every page I open. It's been, a, it's funny, a different one each time just for the photography is worth it, guys. It's absolutely beautiful. Well, thank you so much, Sharon. It was such a wonderful presentation. I learned so much more about you. Yes, uh, you as well. And thanks for having me. Have a it beautiful is, day. It so is fun. my pleasure. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. If you like demos, please come back tomorrow when Sam Turnbull is going to demonstrate some oil-free oatmeal breakfast cookies. Thanks again, Sharon. Be well. Bye-bye. Thank you.